Okay, so question one, part A. So this was the 2020 um, exam paper that, that came up a couple of months ago. So we're told that a car is traveling on a straight road at a uniform speed of 26 meters per second when the driver notices a tractor, which is 91.2 meters ahead. The tractor is traveling at a uniform speed of six meters per second in the same direction as the car. The driver of the car hesitates for T seconds before applying the brakes. The maximum deceleration of the car is five meters per second squared. We wanna find the maximum value of T, which would avoid a collision between the car and the tractor. Okay, so as always, uh, we're just going to draw a diagram um, showing the initial information. Now we're told that the tractor is 91.2 meters in front of the car. You can see here, this is the front of the car, this is the back of the tractor, and the distance between them is 91.2 meters. Okay, so then we're told that the driver of the car hesitates for T seconds. Now, that means that he's just going to continue traveling at his constant speed for T seconds. And then after T seconds, then he's going to immediately apply the brakes. So we're going to draw a time velocity graph for the driver, showing what happens when he hesitates for T seconds, and then what happens when he applies the brakes. Okay, so you can see on this time uh, speed graph, again, time goes along the horizontal. Time is measured in seconds, and the speed V is measured in meters per second. So the car was traveling at a constant speed of 26 meters per second. And it traveled at this speed for T seconds. Okay, the driver hesitated for T seconds. Okay, so it took him a couple of seconds to react. And so that was T seconds. And then what happens, as soon as he reacts, he applies the brakes. And what that does is that causes the car to decelerate to rest. Okay, so the deceleration is, or the acceleration is minus five. The deceleration is five, the acceleration is a minus five. So we have to use a minus five for calculations. So um, I've called, well, we were told that this time was T seconds. So I'm, I'm calling the time for deceleration T1. Now we do know what the initial speed is before he starts to decelerate, that was 26. We know what the final velocity is, that's zero. And we know that the deceleration, the acceleration is minus five. So we should be able to work out what T1 is fairly easy, um, just using V equals U plus AT. Now you can also see here, area one plus area two, that's the total distance that the car is gonna travel before it comes to rest. Now, to find the uh, maximum value of T, we want this car to come to rest just as it catches up with the tractor. Okay, that gives us the maximum value for T. So to calculate T1, so we said the initial velocity was 26, the final velocity is zero, the deceleration is minus five, and the time is T1. So with these four variables, we can use V equals U plus AT. And this means then zero is going to equal 26 minus five times T1. If you bring the minus five T1 over, it becomes a plus five T1 is 26. And then dividing 26 by five gives 5.2 seconds. So it takes the car 5.2 seconds to decelerate the rest. Now we want the um, car just to catch up with the tractor. So this means that the distance traveled by the car should be the same as the distance traveled by the tractor. Now remember though, the tractor did have a 91.2 meter head start, okay? So um, the car has to travel that distance. So we would need to add that on to the distance um, for the tractor as well. So area one plus area two, that's the total distance that the car travels. Now for the tractor then, so the, the tractor had the 91.2 meter head start. The tractor was traveling at a speed of six uh, seconds, sorry, a speed of six meters per second. And the time that it would travel at that speed for would be T plus T1. 
Now we're after working out T1 as 5.2. So that speed of six is going to be for a time of T plus 5.2. So that's really T plus T1. That's the time taken for the driver to hesitate and then um, decelerate the rest. So that's where that T plus 5.2 comes from. So that's your T1 value. Okay, now area one, that was a rectangle. The base was T and the height was 26. So area one is 26 times T. Okay, sorry, uh, this actually should be area two here. Okay, that should be area two. Now area two was a right angle triangle and the area of a right angle triangle is half the base by the perpendicular height. The base was T1, which is 5.2, and the perpendicular height is 26. So area two is gonna be a half of 5.2 by 26. Okay, so that was the rectangle with the base by height, which is 26 times T. And the area of the triangle is a half the base by the perpendicular height. The base was T1, which is 5.2, and the perpendicular height was 26. And then for the tractor, so the tractor had the head start, the 91.2 meters, plus six times T, and six times 5.2 is 31.2. Um, half 5.2 is 2.6, and 2.6 by 26 works out as 67.6. 91.2 plus 31.2, this adds to give 122.4. So this is just a linear equation in terms of t's. If we bring the t's to the left, um, that'll be 26t minus 6t, which is 20t. And you bring the constants to the right, 122.4 minus 67.6 is 54.8. And then if you divide 54.8 by 20, this is a time of 2.74 seconds. So this means the driver of the car hesitated for a time of 2.74 seconds before he applied the brakes. Okay, so that was part A. Part B then. And um, this was a common type question. <clears throat> However, what made this uh, particularly tricky was the fact that we're told that the mass is coalesce. So what's going to happen here, when the mass is coalesce, we're going to be using the principle of conservation of linear momentum. Okay? Now, coalesce means that when two masses collide, they join together and move off with the same speed. Okay? And first part, though, most of the marks will be awarded for this anyway. Okay? And you'll probably find in the exam, it might, might be 20 out of 25 for part one and only five marks for part two. Okay, so um, the first particle, um, that had a mass of 60 grams, and that's projected vertically upwards with a speed of 15 meters per second. So that's the initial velocity of the first particle. And um, after half a second, so that's 0 0.5 seconds, um, a 40 gram mass is projected vertically upwards from the same point with an initial speed of 22.65 meters per second. Part one, we want to calculate the height at which the mass is collide. Now, the first mass was projected upwards with a speed of 15. The second mass is projected upwards with a speed of 22.65. The first mass is in the air for the uh, longer time. The second particle is in the air for the least amount of time. And um, there's two ways you can set this up. Um, to avoid negatives, I always let T be the time for um, the, the particle which is in the air for the least amount of time. That's the second particle. And then that means the first particle will be T plus whatever what the uh, delay time is. It does work the other way as well. You can have T and then T minus the delay time. Okay, so on a diagram, you can see here particle P, that's the first particle, it's projected vertically upwards with a speed of 15 meters per second. Particle Q is projected vertically upwards with a speed of 22.65 meters per second. OK, 
Okay. Um, when the two particles meet, their displacements will be the same. Okay, so uh, S is going to be the same for both particles. And we're looking to calculate the height at which the masses will collide. So I'm going to start off with particle Q um, because that's in the air for the least amount of time. So I'm going to let that time be T. So the initial speed for Q is 22.65. The acceleration for Q would be minus G. The time for Q is T and the displacement for Q is H. Okay. So UQ is 22.65. <clears throat> the acceleration is, again, that's, sorry, that should be a minus G. Okay, so it's a minus G because it's going up. The time for Q is T and the displacement for Q is H. So if we use S equals UT plus a half AT squared, so the displacement S is H. So H is going to equal U is 22.65 times T. And then it's going to be plus a half times A is minus G times the time, which is T to be squared. So this just means H is 22.65 minus GT squared over two. Okay, so we're after formulating this equation for two unknowns. So H and T are the two unknowns. And um, we can label this as equation number one. We have to do the exact same thing then for particle P. So for particle P, the only difference is that UP is going to be 15, and the time for P is going to be T plus 0 0.5. So um, particle P was in the air a half a second more than particle Q. The displacements are the same. So with all of these types of problems, the displacements are the same and the decelerations are the same. And there will always be some relationship between the times. So if we do the same thing then for particle P, so the initial velocity of P is 15. The acceleration of P is a minus G. The time for P is T plus 0 0.5 and the displacement for P is H. Okay, so the time is T plus half a second, T plus 0 0.5. So again, if we use S equals UT plus a half AT squared, this means H is going to equal 15 times T plus 0 0.5 plus a half times minus G times the time, which is T plus 0 0.5 to be squared. Now, if you like, you can put in 9.8 for G. And um, just with these questions, it's usually easier to leave it in terms of G. Okay? Um, it, it means you won't need to use a calculator. Okay, You can do these calculations in your head if you leave them in terms of G. So next of all, then H is going to be 15T plus 7.5 minus a half G can be written as G over 2 on and T plus 0 0.5 to be squared. If we square this, if first of all square the first term, that becomes T squared. To get the middle term, it's twice the product. If you multiply T by 0 0.5, that's 0 0.5T. And if you double that, you just get T. And then finally, to get the third term, 0 0.5 to be squared is 0 0.25. So then this means H is going to be, so we've got the 15T plus 7.5 minus, and if you multiply in, we're going to get GT squared over 2 minus GT over 2. And then we've got and two goes into 0 0.25 to give 0 0.125 G. So here then we've got this second equation in terms of H and T. So H and T are variables. G is not a variable, G is a constant, G is always the 9.8.
Okay, so we've got H then equals 15t plus 7.5 minus gt squared over 2 minus gt minus 0.125g. So I can label this then as equation number two. So we're after formulating a system of two equations with two unknowns. Now, these are two quadratic equations. But you notice the left-hand sides are the same in both equations. Both the left-hand sides were given in terms of h. So equation number one, we had h equaled 22.65t minus gt squared over 2. And equation number two then, we've got h equals 15t plus 7.5 minus gt squared over 2 minus gt over 2 minus 0.125g. So if we equate the two right-hand sides for equation number one and equation number two, so this was the right-hand side for equation number one, and this is the right-hand side for equation number two. What always happens is that the square terms always cancel out. So the gt squared over two in this side cancels with the gt squared over two in this side, okay? So the square terms always cancel out. What means is that this reduces straight away from a quadratic equation to a linear equation. So to solve a linear equation, we're going to get all the t's on one side and all the constants on the other side. So this term has a t in it, this term has a t in it, and this term has a t in it. Okay. Now, at this stage, I'm going to replace this g with uh, 9.8. So this gives minus uh, 4.9t. Okay, and then what we're left with is 7.5 minus 0 0.125 times 9.8. So we're going to leave all the constants on the right, and we're going to bring the t's to the left. So we've got 22.65 minus 15. When you bring that over, that's going to become a plus 4.9. And if we factorize out the t, this is what we get on the right, on the left-hand side. So we've got the 22.65 minus the 15 plus the 4.9. And if we take out the t, and then on the right-hand side, the two constants we said was the 7.5 and minus 0 0.125 times the g, which is 9.8. So using our calculator, 22.65 minus 15 plus 4.9 gives 12.55. And then on the right-hand side, 7.5 minus 0 0.125 by 9.8. And using our calculator, that works out as 6.275. If you divide 6.275 by 12.55, this works out exactly as 0 0.5 seconds. So this means that the second particle was um, sorry, the first particle <coughs> took a total time of one second, and the second particle took a total time of half a second. So the time for P is one second, time for Q is half a second. Okay, next of all, to find the height at which the collision occurred, we can substitute this value for T into either equation number two, or into equation number one. And this was uh, the right-hand side for equation number one. So it would be easier to use equation number one, okay? but you can use equation number two if you like. So with equation number one, I'm gonna replace this T with 0 0.5, and I'm gonna replace this T with 0 0.5. So H then is 22.65 times the time is 0 0.5 minus g over 2 times the time to be squared, which is 0 0.5 squared. Okay, and we can replace this g over 2 with 4.9. So that's 9.8 over 2. It's just 4.9. 22.65 by a half is 11.325. And this means then that the height of which the collision occurs is 10.1. Meters. So particle P and particle Q reach a height of 10.1 meters 
um, when the collision occurs. Now, for the next part, we're going to need to know what the velocity of P was and the velocity of Q was just at the instant before that collision took place. Okay, so to find the velocity for P, now the initial velocity for P was 15, the acceleration for P is minus G, the time for the first particle is one second, and we're looking to find the velocity for P. So for the first particle, the initial speed is 15, the deceleration is minus G, the time is one, and we're looking for the velocity. So this is the this will tell us the speed of the first particle just at the instant, just before the collision took place. So if we use V equals U plus AT, V is going to be 15 plus uh, A is then minus 9.8 and the time is one. So this means the speed of the first particle just at the instant, just before the collision took place is 5.2 meters per second. Now we have to do exactly the same thing then for particle Q. So the initial speed for particle Q was the 22.65. The acceleration for Q was minus G. Now the time for Q was half a second. It was 0 0.5. And we need to find then the velocity for Q. So again, the initial speed is 22.65. The acceleration for Q is minus G. The time for Q is only half a second. And we need to find the velocity for Q. So we need to find the speed of the second particle just at that instant, just before the collision took place. So once again, if we use V equals U plus AT, this means V is going to be 22.65 minus 9.8 by 0 0.5. And this means, using a calculator, the velocity of particle Q is 17.75 meters per second. Okay, so you can see here, <coughs> particle Q is moving faster than particle P. So P went first, Q is catching up with it. Now, when the collision takes place, what happens is that the speed of P is going to increase, but Q then decreases. Okay. Now, usually they move off with different speeds, but what happens here is that the, the two objects coalesce. That means that they sort of join together and they move off with a common speed. So next of all, we want to find what that... Uh, common speed is. Okay. So we're going to use the principle of conservation of linear momentum. So this is denoted by PCM. Okay, so um, when we study collisions, we use this um, equation quite a lot. So the principle of conservation of linear momentum states in any collision or impact, the total momentum before impact equals the total momentum after impact provided that there are no external forces, such as friction. So M1, U1, that's the mass times the initial speed of the first particle, plus M2, U2, the mass times the initial speed of the second particle is M1, V1, that's the mass times the final velocity of the first particle, plus M2, V2, that's the mass times the uh, final speed of the second particle. Now, if the two particles coalesce, that means that they move off with the same speed. So that means V1 and V2 are the same. So we can just replace this with V. We can just let V1 equal V2 equal V. So the principle of conservation in momentum, this equation modifies slightly if they coalesce. And you get M1 U1 plus M2 U2 is M1 times V, plus M2 times V. Okay, um, in some books, you notice that they factorize out the V. And you can write that as M1 plus M2 times V, if you like. Okay, there's, there's no difference, really. So this is the principle 
of conservation of linear momentum if both particles coalesce. They both move off with the same speed v. This one is in the equation. This one is in the maths and formula tables. This one isn't. Okay, so you're expected to know this. So coalesce means both particles join together and move off with the same speed. Okay, so here, um, M1 is the mass of the first particle. And um, that was 60 grams. 60 grams is 0 0.06 of a kilogram. Uh, technically, you don't need to convert this to kilograms. You could leave everything in grams if you like. Okay, but just to have the correct units, we will convert everything to um, kilograms. But it does work perfectly correctly if you leave it in, in terms of grams. So M1 is 0 0.06. U1 is the initial speed of the first particle. That was just at the instant before the collision. And just before the collision, we Said, well, we worked out its speed as 5.2 meters per second. So U1 is 5.2. The second mass, M2, um, this was 40 grams. So that's going to be 0 0.04. And U2 was the speed of particle Q just before impact. And we worked that out as 17.75. So this is going to equal M1 is 0 0.06 times V plus M2 is 0 0.04 times V. So the mass times the speed just before impact plus the second mass times its speed just before impact is going to equal 0 0.6 times V plus 0 0.04 times V. Now the left-hand side then, if you put that into your calculator, that just works out as 1.022. On the right hand side, 0 0.06 plus 0 0.04 adds to give 0 0.1 times V. And to get V, if you divide 1.022 by 0 0.1, or simply multiplying both sides by 10, V works out as 10.22 meters per second. So this is the common speed of both particles immediately after impact. Okay. Now, both of these particles are moving up, so they're going to decelerate due to gravity. And we want to find the uh, greatest height that both of these particles have reached. So if their speed is 10.22, the final speed is going to be zero. That's because um, gravity, which is minus 9.8, slows them down. And we need to find out the distance s that they travel. So if u is 10.22 and the final speed v is going to be zero, they're going to decelerate with gravity, which is minus g, and we need to find out what s is. So with these four letters, v squared equals u squared plus 2s. So we're going to use the equation v squared equals u squared plus 2s. So this means zero squared is going to equal 10.22 squared plus two times. And in this case, we will need to put in minus 9.8 for G. And S is the unknown. So this means then zero is going to be 10.22 squared works out as 104.4484. And this is minus 19.6 S. Now, if that's a minus 19.6s on this side, you bring it over, it becomes a plus 19.6s on the left-hand side. So 19.6s is, and this was the 10.22 squared. So to find out what s is, if we divide 10.4 or 104.4484 by 19.6, this tells us, so the two masses, when they coalesced, they would travel a further distance of 5.329 meters. Now, the question asked to what was the greatest height reached by the two particles? This would be the greatest height above ground level. So the two particles had already traveled 10.1 meters before they actually met. And then when they joined together, they traveled an additional 5.329. 
This is 5.33 two decimal places. So the greatest height reached is going to be 10.1 plus 5.33, and that works out as 15.43 meters. Okay, so um, that question was very time consuming. Okay, you know, you're expected to get this done in 25 minutes. And um, like that whole question has taken us close to half an hour. Okay, so that was question one. Uh, we're gonna move on now to question two. Okay, so here in question two, we're told that two straight roads intersect at an angle of 30 degrees. Power A is moving along one road towards the intersection with a uniform speed of six meters per second. You can see car A is moving along the horizontal. So it's moving to the right or east with a speed of six. Car B is moving along the other road towards the intersection with a uniform speed of eight meters per second. Find the velocity of B relative to A. Now you can see here, power B is moving roughly in this direction. Well, it is moving this direction. And that direction is roughly northeast. Northeast means we've got a positive I and a positive J. Positive I for east, positive J for north. So to calculate the velocity of B relative to A, we first of all need to find the velocity of car A and the velocity of car B. So car A is moving east with a speed of six. This means the velocity of A is 6i. Now for car B, so you can see here the angle relative to the horizontal is 30 degrees. So that's 30, this angle here would be 30. So the velocity of B is going to be 8 cos 30i plus 8 sine 30j. Now the reason why the i and j components are both positive is because it's roughly northeast. Okay. North is a positive J, East is a positive I. Now, using your calculator, if you put in A cos of 30, so cos of 30 is root three over two. If you multiply that by eight, that gives four root three. Sine of 30 is a half, eight times a half is four. So the velocity of car B is four root three I plus four J. Now, by definition, VBA is VB minus VA. So this means then VBA is going to be 4 root 3i plus 4j minus 6i. Now, using a calculator, 4 root 3 minus 6 works out as 0.928i, and then we still have the plus 4j. So the velocity of B relative to A is 0.928i, plus 4j. Now the velocity of b relative to a means you must calculate the magnitude and direction. If you're asked to calculate velocity, it's not okay to leave it in terms of i's and j's. You must get the magnitude and the direction. Okay, so calculate the velocity of b relative to a means you need magnitude and direction. Okay, so to get the magnitude, we're gonna use by Tyler's theorem. So the magnitude of VBA is going to be the square root of 0 0.928 squared plus 4 squared. And using our calculator, if you get the square root of 0 0.928 squared plus 4 squared, this works out as 4.11 meters per second. So this is the speed, the relative speed. So if B is moving and A is stationary, the, the relative speed is 4.11. Next of all, we need to calculate the direction. The tan of theta is the positive j over the positive i. So the tan of the angle is the 4 over 0 0.928. So this means theta then is going to be the inverse tan of 4 over 0 0.928. And if you get the inverse tan of 4 over 0 0.928, this gives an angle of 76.94 degrees. So because the I component was positive, it means the direction is east. We then make an angle of 76.94 degrees. And because the J component was also positive, that's then north. So the actual direction is east, 76.94 degrees toward the north. 
Okay, now what we've done so far, that will be worth 15 out of 25. Okay, so you get 60% for doing what we've done so far. Okay, um, a very common, um, that type of question. Um, it's just that the rest of the question is going to be the trickier part, but you, but you should be, everyone should be getting um, 15 out of 25 um, for that. Okay, so there's nothing new in that. Okay, the next of all then we're told that car A reaches the intersection five seconds before B. So what this means is that when B reaches the intersection, car A would have had five seconds to move on further. Now you always find out um, the more awkward one. You always put the more awkward one at the origin. Okay, so car B is the one which is more awkward. So when car B gets the origin, we want to work out what, what car A is. Okay, now, so when B is at the origin, and um, A had five more seconds to move on. Now, A moves with a speed of six for five seconds. That means it would have moved on 30 meters. So what this means is that when B is at the intersection, A is going to be 30 meters past the intersection. Okay. So, with these questions, we only ever show the relative velocity vector on a diagram, okay? So when solving all of these problems, we always use the relative velocity and we don't use the individual velocities. So the velocity of B relative to A, that made an angle of 76.94 degrees and that would be relative to the horizontal. So if we construct an I and J plane, and we, we're going to show the position of B and A and the relative velocity vector. You can see this is the horizontal axis. This is your I axis. This is your J axis. So the J is always perpendicular to the I. Now, when car B was at the intersection, okay, we can think of that as being at the origin. A moved 30 meters past the origin. So A would be here. So the distance between A and B is 30 meters. Now this vector here is the velocity of B relative to A. Okay, now I've called that some angle theta, even though we worked at that angle theta to be 76.94 degrees. Okay, so this is the path car B makes relative to A. So instead of B moving and A moving, this is the same as A being stationary, and then B would move along this path. Now, along this path, we know the speed is 4.11, and we know the angle is 76.94. Now, usually we're looking for this shortest distance. So the shortest distance is always a perpendicular distance. So if car B gets to this point C, then this distance from A to C, that's a perpendicular distance. That's going to be the uh, closest car B would get the part car A. Okay, so that's a perpendicular. Now, if this length is 30, and this is some angle theta, um, the shortest distance would be 30 sine theta. And the reason why it's sine, it's because it's opposite the angle. So this length would be 30 sine theta. Now, the distance from B to C, this would actually be 30 cos theta. This would be 30 cos theta. Okay. So usually the question does state um, what is the shortest distance, okay? But we're not looking for that here, okay? What we want to know is um, where car A and B are relative to the origin when they're closest to each other. Now, the cars are closest to each other when car B gets to this point C. So we want to know how long this takes. So we want to find out how long it takes car B to get from the origin to this point C. Now time is distance over speed. The distance is 30 cos of theta and the speed along this path, the speed is 4.11 meters per second. So to calculate the time taken for car B to get from the origin to this point C, we're going to be using time is distance over speed. So 
So the distance is 30 cos theta and the speed is 4.11, where the angle theta is uh, 76.94. So if we use time as distance over speed, time is going to be, so we said the distance is 30 cos of theta and theta is 76.94 all over and the speed along this path is 4.11. So using your calculator, 30 times the cost of 76.94 degrees over 4.11, this works out as 1.65 seconds. So what this means is that um, after 1.65 seconds, the cars would have been closest to each other. But what we're looking to find out is where both cars would actually be. Uh, relative to the intersection. Now, um, B was at the origin. After 1.65 seconds, we want to know how far B is going to be away from the origin. Now, we know the car B travels with a speed of eight. So distance is going to be speed by time. The speed is eight, and the time is 1.65. This will tell us how far car B is now going to be away from the intersection. So for car B, if we use distance of speed by time, the distance from car B to the origin is going to be eight times 1.65, and that works out as 13.2 meters. Now, if we do the same thing for car A, now you can see though that when B was at the intersection, A was actually 30 meters past it. However, in another 1.65 seconds, car A is going to move further on. And we need to find out then the total distance car A is from the intersection. So for car A, the distance from O to A is going to be, so it was 30 meters away, and then it travels at a speed of, sorry, that should be a six, not an eight. So car A travels at a speed of six times 1.65. Just going to double check that. So if you get 30 plus 6 times 1.65, that works out as 39.9 meters. Okay, so the total distance car A is going to be away from the intersection is 30 plus the speed is 6 and the uh, time is 1.65 and that would be 39.9 meters. Okay, so um, there were two quite challenging questions. Okay. okay, so we're going to move on then to projectiles. Okay, um, so for... Today, I'm going to do the 2013 and 2014. And for homework for next week, then I want you to do the next four years. So you're going to do 15, 16, 17, and 18 for, for next Sunday. Okay. So I did send you um, a handout with the uh, projectile notes from, from 50. Okay. So there was no question about swimmers on the test. On swimmers? Yeah, it's part B to question two. Did like I leave that out? It. Yeah, it's after that one there. Oh, sorry, there is another one. Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, yeah, I do have that.
okay? Can you see the screen okay? Yep. Hello? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you can see this one. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, this type of question has come up before. Um, this was probably the most difficult one of these, though. Okay. So it was like splitting it up into two different questions. Okay. So uh, this is question two, part B. A woman can swim at five eighths meters per second in still water, and she swims across a river of width D. She sets out at right angles to the bank, and the current flows parallel to the straight banks. So it flows at a half a meter per second for the first part of our journey and half a meter per second for the remainder of our journey. She starts from the point A and the current changes when she reaches the point B and she lands at a point C. She finds that when she has reached the other side, she has drifted downstream a distance equal to the width of the river. B is a distance X from the bank as shown in the diagram. And we have to find X in terms of D. Okay, so this is the diagram that was given um, with the question. So you can see here, she starts from this position A. And first of all, she's going to get to position B. Okay, and you were told that this was X. And similarly, from A to C, that was some distance D. So we're going to split this up into two separate parts. First of all, going from A to B. Now, when we do this, we're going to draw two triangles. We're going to draw a velocity triangle, and we're going to draw a distance triangle. It's very important to draw these two triangles separate, okay? because you don't want to mix up distances and velocities in the one triangle. Okay. Now, we're told that she heads straight across. So for the velocity triangle, so this is the velocity of the woman relative to the river. So if there was no current flowing, she would uh, continue going in this direction with a speed of five over eight. Okay, but the, the river is flowing with a speed of a half. So this would be the actual velocity of the woman, okay? But we don't need to know this, okay? So VW would be the actual velocity of the woman. Now, we were told that this distance is X. Now, I've just called this some distance Y. So that would be the distance from here to here. That's gonna be some distance Y. Okay. Now, this is Y and this is X. This green triangle is a distance triangle, and this black triangle is a velocity triangle. These two triangles are similar. Similar means they've got the same angles. So this angle is the same as this angle, that's a right angle, that's a right angle, and this angle is the same as that angle. If triangles are similar, it means the sides are in proportion. So this means that y over x in the green triangle that's exactly the same as a half over five eighths in the black triangle. So y over x in the green triangle is the same as a half over five eighths in the black triangle. Okay, so y over x in the green is the same as a half over five eighths in the black. Now, when you have one fraction divided by another fraction, that's the same as a half multiplied by eight over five, and that works out as four over five. So this means y over x is the same as four over five. And if we bring the x across and multiply, y is going to equal four x over five. So we now know what this distance here is. Now, if this distance from here to here is four x over five, so the distance from here to here is four x over five. This means this remaining distance is d minus 4x over 5. So for the next part of the journey, um, her velocity is the same. That's 5 over 8. But what does change is the current. It changes from a half to 1. Okay. So for the second part of the question, then, we're going to be going from b to c. 
So we're going to have this distance triangle going from B to C. Now, again, if this total distance is D and this part is X, this remaining distance would be D minus X. And from here to here, we said that distance is going to be D minus 4X over 5. Okay, so for the second part, so we said this distance is I worked out Y as 4X over 5. That means this remaining distance is going to be D minus 4X over 5. And if all of this was D and this is X, that remaining part is D minus X. Okay. So we're going to construct a right angle triangle here with a distance triangle. Okay, and then this is your velocity triangle. Okay. So the velocity of the woman relative to the river is five over eight. If there was no current flowing, the woman would continue in this direction with a speed of five over eight. However, the river is flowing, so the current increased to one. But once again, these triangles are similar. So this green triangle is similar to this black triangle. Similar means the angles are the same or the sides are in proportion. So this means that D minus 4X over 5 all over D minus X is going to be the same as 1 over 5 over 8. So that length over this length, because the triangles are similar, it's the same as this length over this length. So we've got D minus 4X over 5 all over D minus X is the same as 1 over 5 over 8. Now, 1 divided by 5 over 8 is the same as 8 over 5. So we've got D minus 4X over 5 all over D minus X equals 8 over 5. And if we cross multiply, 5 multiplied by D is 5D. 5 multiplied by minus 4X over 5, the 5s it cancel, and you'll just get 4X. So you're going to get 5D minus 4X. The D minus X, if we bring that over and multiply with the 8, we get 8D minus 8X. And if we bring the Xs to one side, and that'll become uh, 8x minus 4x, which is 4x, bringing the d's to one side, 8d minus 5d is 3d. So 4x is 3d, and then this means x is going to equal 3d over 4. Okay, and um, that was a particularly tricky question, that one, okay? So there were sort of two parts to that. Um, traditionally, when these come up, you'd only have to do one of these. Okay, so this is the first time um, I've ever seen uh, two stages. Okay, has anyone any questions on them? No, thank you. Okay, okay, and um, they were particularly tricky. Them, okay, they were definitely trickier than the usual type question. Okay, so we're going to move on then to projectiles. Um, sir, yes. I meant to ask, is the, like what do we do a pre with you, or do we have yes. to do that in school? Um, like some sometimes in school, your school may do a pre as well. Um, so you, you can do a pre in school, but usually I would do a pre um during Easter time, which is oh, okay, because okay. I know our schools okay, I know that it's different, it's probably changed now with like all the new restrictions come in. But yeah. um, like the schools were planning to do it at the beginning of February, so would you, yours yeah. would be quite different to that. Yeah, like you, usually I like I'd usually wait till we've covered uh, six topics, exam paper topics. You know what I mean, so that you're you're prepared for for a pre. And um, okay. And to be honest with you, Eva, it's uh, it's highly unlikely you're going to be doing pre's this year. You know that. Yeah. You know, unless they're pushed on to to Easter time, but. Uh, uh, it's it's highly likely you'll, you'll be coming back to do pre's in, in February. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That okay. Yeah. Um. So them them two questions. Uh. Definitely trickier than usual. Okay. Um. 
So don't be too put off if you find them particularly difficult. Okay. Okay, now the first question I'm going to move on to is um, on projectiles. Um, however, um, the part B in this question involves differentiation. Has everyone here done differentiation? Has anyone not done differentiation? Okay, so I'll take that silence as mean you've all done it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yes. What what about integration? Has everyone done integration? Yeah. Yep. yep. Has anybody no. not done integration? Uh, yeah. I have. Who hasn't done it? Um, uh, Eva. Uh, Eva. Denisha. Denisha. Okay, you haven't done integration yet. Okay, that's okay. Um, it's just we still have to cover differential equations, but we can't do differential equations and you do integration in school. Is that okay? Um, so we're just going to proceed and continue with, with uh, topics. Um, uh, we still have to do projectiles, connected particles, collisions, and uh, circular motion, simple harmonic motion. And then after that, then we can, uh, we can move on to differential equations. At that stage, you should have integration covered, okay? And um, it's just sometimes in projectiles, now it is rare, but it actually comes up this year in 2013 that you have to use differentiation, okay? This is the hardest type of question, but don't be too put off by it because it's usually only five marks is worth for the differentiation, okay? And if you make attempt in the right direction, you get two out of five anyway, okay? So um, you, you may find the very last part of this quite difficult, but don't be too put off by it because you can still get 47 out of 50 without being able to deal with the differentiation uh, uh, 100%, okay? Okay, so we're gonna start off Sorry, sir, just to clarify, uh, our homework is 2015 through 2018, isn't it? And um, it's 2015 to 2018, yes. Now, due next I'm Sunday. Ju I'm just going to double check that we, like we, we may not get 2014 fully done. Is that okay? Um, That's fine. It's just the question one and question two we done were particularly hard. And, um, you know, you're supposed to get these questions done in 25 minutes, and, and they've taken us over an hour to do the two of them. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, it was just because. I think this was done by design. The 2020 was particularly hard. Um, is that okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll go as far as we can, but if we don't get 2014 finished, then you might have to do that for homework then. Is that okay? We'll see, we'll see how far we get. Okay, so 2013 question three. A party gets projected from a point on horizontal ground. The speed of projection is U at an angle alpha to the horizontal. The range of the particle is R and the maximum height reached is or over four root three. The first thing we want to show is that the range or is two u squared sine alpha cos alpha over g, and then we want to find the value of alpha. Uh, very important with projectiles, always to draw a diagram. Okay. So here on this diagram, so this is your standard diagram. You've got your i-axis. You can think of that as being like your I or your X axis and your J or your Y axis. Okay. So initially the particle is projected from the origin. So with projectiles, no matter what the question states, our starting point will always be at the origin. Even if you're on a cliff, you treat the top of the cliff as being the origin. That's the point of projection. So this is the path, which is called the trajectory of your projectile. And at the maximum height, you'll notice here that the tangent vector is horizontal. That vector has only got um, an I component. So Vy equals zero. So we've got a Vx, but, but the Vy is zero. Okay, it's because the tangent vector is horizontal. When the particle lands, its height above ground is zero. Sy equals zero. The distance from your starting point to when the particle lands, this is Sx, and here we're told that's the range R. So Sx equals R. So the range of the particle is R. Okay, we're also told that the maximum height reached was R over four root three. So Sy works out as R over four root three. 
The first thing we want to calculate though is the range. And we want to show that R works out as two U squared sine alpha cos alpha over G. So this is um, a general case. Okay. So the initial speed is U and we've got this angle alpha. Yes, yeah, so initial speed is U and we have this angle alpha. So your initial velocity vector U then is U cos alpha I plus U sine alpha J. So U is U cos alpha I plus U sine alpha J. So for the range, we have to calculate SX and this occurs when SY equals zero. So you sort of need to know these conditions off by heart. So for the range, you need to find SX and this occurs when SY equals zero. Now the equation for SY, SY is UIT minus a half G times T squared. So UY, this is U sine alpha. T is what we're looking to find, minus a half G times T squared. And when the particle lands, SY is zero. So zero is going to equal U sine alpha T minus a half G times T squared. And to get rid of fractions, we're going to multiply it across by two. Okay, and then if we factorize out the T, so you multiply by two and factorize out a T. So taking out the T, you're still left with two U sine alpha minus GT. So when you multiply it by two, you get two U sine alpha T minus GT squared. That's a quadratic in terms of T with no constant term. And if you factorize out the T, you're left with T on 2u sine alpha minus gt. So the trivial solution is t equals zero. Okay, so that was the starting time. However, we're looking for the time it took the particle to land. So if you solve 2u sine alpha minus gt equals zero, you get 2u sine alpha equals gt. And that means t is 2u sine alpha all over g. So that's the trivial solution. We're not interested in that. Okay, you don't have to work out the two mathematical solutions. Okay, if you're doing project maths, you always have to work out the two mathematical solutions. In applied maths, we're only interested in the physical solution. Okay, so you don't actually need to work out this one. So t is two u sine alpha over g. That represents the time of flight. Now to find the range, we're going to use s x equals u x times t. Okay, so SX is just UX times T. Now UX is the U cos alpha and T is 2U sine alpha all over G. And when you multiply this in, you get two U by U is U squared cos alpha sine alpha all over G. So the range R works out as two U squared sine alpha cos alpha all over G. Okay, so next of all, the maximum height of the particle. So for the max height, we need to find SY, and this occurs when VY equals zero. Okay, so these things, you need to learn these off by heart. You should know these off by heart. So for the range, find SX when SY equals zero. For the maximum height, you need to find SY when VY equals zero. Okay, so these conditions, you need to know these off by heart. They're not given in the tables. Now the equation for VY, VY is UY minus G times T. Now UY is zero, sorry, VY is zero and UY is U sine alpha minus G times T. And if we solve this, um, so GT is U sine alpha, which means T is U sine alpha over G. Now the time for the maximum height is always half the time for the range. So the time for the range did work out as two U sine alpha all over G. So here we're gonna substitute that time into the equation for SY. 
And again, SY is UYT minus a half G times T squared. This means SY is going to be, so UI was your U sine alpha, T is U sine alpha over G, minus a half G times T is U sine alpha over G all to be squared. Now, if you multiply these two together, you get U squared sine squared alpha over G, minus G over two times U squared sine squared alpha all over G. And what happens is that um, we had a G squared on the bottom and that cancels with one of the Gs, we just give G. So you get U squared sine squared alpha over two G. And we need a two here as well. So we get two here, we need a two here. So you get two U squared sine squared alpha over two G minus one U squared sine squared alpha over two G. And then that just gives U squared sine squared alpha over two G. So the SY, we were told that was R over four root three. So R over four root three equals U squared sine squared alpha over two G. Now we've just worked out what R was. Um, so we, we said R was two U squared sine squared alpha um, all over G. And if we wanna get R on its own here, we can bring this four root three across and multiply. So here, R is going to equal um, two root three u squared sine squared alpha over G. So you can see um, that two divides into the four to give two. So you're going to have two root three u squared sine squared alpha over G. So we found out R using two different methods and we're going to equate these two then. So um, for the first part, R was two u squared cos alpha sine alpha over G. And then here we found it R to be two root three U squared sine squared alpha over G. The U squareds cancel on both sides. The Gs cancel on both sides. We can get rid of a sine alpha on both sides. So these twos go, the U squareds go. Uh, that sine alpha cancels with the square and the Gs go. So on the left-hand side, you're just gonna be left with cos alpha. And on the right-hand side, we're gonna be left with two root three sine alpha. Now, if we divide both sides by uh, cos alpha, so that'll become one equals root three. If you divide that by cos alpha, sine alpha over cos alpha is tan alpha. So one is gonna equal root three tan alpha. And then this means then the tan of alpha will be one over root three. And then alpha is going to be the inverse tan of one over root three. And inverse tan of one over root three works out as 30 degrees. So we found the angle alpha to be 30 degrees. Okay, so that's a standard type question now. Part B then. So part A is going to be projectiles on a horizontal plane and part B is going to be projectiles either up or down an inclined plane. And again, very, very important to draw a diagram. So 2013, question three, part B. A plane is inclined at an angle inverse tan of a half to the horizontal. So that's the angle, the inclined plane, which is going to be our i-axis is going to make relative to the horizontal. A particle is projected up the plane with a speed of u meters per second at an angle theta to the inclined plane. The plane of projection is vertical and contains the line of greatest slope. Now that line will always be given on your um, on the exam paper. That just means that you're dealing with projectiles on a two-dimensional plane. You're not dealing with three-dimensional projectiles. Okay. And um, in third level, you you know, if you want to study sort of physics or um, engineering or applied mathematics, you would be dealing with projectiles in three dimensions. Okay. So for leaving certo, you only deal with um, two-dimensional geometry. Uh, that line is just there just solely because you're dealing with two-dimensional geometry. 
Okay, so you don't have to worry about that line in the exam paper. We want to find the value of theta that will give a maximum range of the inclined plane. With projectiles, if you're asked for a maximum, it means you're going to be differentiating. Okay, so there is a um, bit of work with this. But um, 20 out of 25 marks usually go for finding what the range or is in terms of theta. And then only five marks go for differentiating. So with um, inclined planes, again, always draw a diagram showing the particles projected from the origin, showing the angle the inclined plane makes, the angle the projectile makes with the inclined plane, and the initial speed u. Okay, so this diagram, very, very important. So this i-axis represents your inclined plane. Okay, that's the inclined plane. Okay, this inclined plane then makes, we always call this some angle beta. So that's the angle the inclined plane makes with the horizontal. Now we're told here that beta is inverse tan of a half. That means that the tan of beta is a half. So beta is always the angle that the inclined plane makes relative to the horizontal. We usually use alpha to represent the angle that the particle makes with the inclined plane. Now, in this question, we've used theta instead of alpha. If you want to, you can just say, let theta equal alpha, okay, if you want to. So you can just replace that theta with alpha throughout the question. You could just start off and say, let theta equal alpha, and then use alpha as we used to use, okay? Um, I'm going to use theta, but we've traditionally used alpha for that. This is the initial velocity vector, and this is the speed u. That's the tangent vector from the origin. Now, again, this is the path of your projectile. This is called the trajectory. And when the particle lands, as always, the condition is that sy equals zero. Okay, your height above the i-axis is zero. This is the range sx. Okay, that's your displacement along the i-axis from your starting point. So this distance here is your range. So what we're looking to find out, uh, which angle will give a maximum range. And um, if you're dealing with projectiles on a horizontal plane, an angle of 45 degrees gives a maximum range. But here we're dealing with projectiles on inclined planes. So it's going to be different. So what we're going to do here is what we always do, first of all, anyway, is work out your initial velocity vector, and then we need to calculate the range. So we need to find out what Sx is when Sy equals zero. Okay, and most of the marks go for that. Okay, so your initial velocity vector, so it's usually u cos alpha i plus u sine alpha j, but we're using theta here instead of alpha. So your initial velocity vector is u cos theta i plus u sine theta j. Okay, so we need to find the range. So we need to find Sx, and this occurs when Sy equals zero. Okay, now the equations for Sx and Sy for projectiles on inclined planes change um, for projectiles on horizontal planes. Now the equation for Sy, Sy is uyt, minus a half g cos of beta times t squared. Okay, so you need to know these equations off by heart. Now remember, ui uses a u sine. Okay, so ui is u sine theta. That means you're gonna be followed by a g cos beta. So when you're working at sx, sx is gonna be uxt, and that uses u cos theta, and that'll be followed by minus a half g sine of beta times t squared. Okay, so that's how you sort of memorize these. Okay, so Sy is uyt minus a half g cos of beta times t squared. Now we were told what the tan of beta was. Well, we were told that the angle beta is inverse tan of a half. So the tan of beta is a half. Now we need to know what both sine and cos beta are. To do that, if we construct a right angle triangle and mark in some angle beta, tan is the opposite over the adjacent. That's going to be one over two. 
Using Pythagoras' theorem, this will be root five. So this means that the sine of beta is going to be one over root five. Cos of beta will be two over root five. Okay, so that means we can replace this cos of beta with two over root five. And UY is U sine theta. And SY is zero. So we're going to get zero equals U sine theta T minus half G is G over two. Cos of beta is two over root five times T squared. Now what happens here, the twos will cancel. So we're still left with this root five in the bottom. So if we multiply everything by root five, zero is going to equal root five u sine theta times t minus, and we said the twos cancel, and you're just going to be left with gt squared. And this is a quadratic equation in terms of t with no constant term. So we can just factorize out a t. And then we can solve both of these linear expressions. So we get the trivial solution t equals zero, which we don't need. Or if we solve this equal to zero, and t is just going to equal root five u sine theta all over g. So t is root five u sine theta over g. So that represents the time of flight. We now need to substitute that time into the equation for sx. Now the equation for sx is going to be uxt minus a half g sine of beta times t squared. Okay, so you need to know these off by heart. These are not given in the maths and formula tables. Okay, so using that time, sx is uxt minus a half g sine beta times t squared. So this means sx is gonna be ux is u cos theta. Now we're after working out the time t to be root five u sine theta over g minus a half g can be written as g over two. The sine of beta is one over root five times root five u sine theta over g all to be squared. So this works out as um, root five u squared cos theta sine theta over g minus g over two root five on Squaring this, you get five. Squaring this, you get u squared. Squaring this, you get sine squared theta all over g squared. And what happens here then, the g will cancel with the square. The root five divides into the five to give a root five. And you'll notice here, we've got two g left in the bottom. So there's two G here. So we'd like to have a two here and a two here. So the common denominator would be two G. So this then means SX is going to equal two root five U squared cos theta sine theta minus root five U squared sine squared theta. Now what's common to these two terms on the bottom, we've got a 2g. We can take that out in front. We can also take out the u squared and the root 5. So we can take out the root 5 u squared over 2g out in front. And then we're left with 2 cos theta sine theta minus sine squared theta. Now, 2 cos theta sine theta, that is actually one of the trigonometric identities in the maths and formula tables. And that's actually the same as the sine of 2 theta. So 2 cos theta sine theta is the same as the sine of 2 theta. So that means that the range R can be written as root 5 u squared over 2g on, this is the same as sine 2 theta minus sine squared theta. Okay. So 20 out of 25 marks should be awarded for calculating what we've done so far. To find the maximum value for the range, or which value of theta gives a maximum, we're gonna to have to differentiate this function. So R here is your dependent variable. It's dependent on theta. 
So this is like y is some function in terms of x. So when we differentiate this, we call it the r d theta. Okay. And the reason why we're going to differentiate, if you differentiate any function and put it equal to zero, it will give you a maximum or a minimum. Now, in this case, it gives the maximum. And um, with applied maths, you never have to prove that it was the maximum, okay? Because when you differentiate, it may give a maximum or a minimum. You don't have to use the second derivative test to determine whether it was a maximum or a minimum, okay? Just differentiating it and putting it equal to zero, uh, that value will be either the maximum or minimum, whatever was asked. Okay, so the maximum value of the function r occurs when the r dt equals zero. So we're going to have to differentiate this and equate it equal to zero. So the r dt is going to equal. Now, all of this is just a constant, and that constant will stay out in front. Okay? So we can just leave this constant multiple out in front. Now, when you differentiate the sine of 2 theta, when you differentiate the sine, it becomes a cos of 2 theta. But then you have to use the chain rule, and then you have to differentiate 2 theta, and that gives times 2. So if you differentiate sine 2 theta, this will give 2 cos 2 theta. Next of all, if you differentiate sine square theta, this is the same as the sine of theta all to be squared. If you've got the sine of theta all to be squared, the first thing you have to deal with is the power of two. So the two goes down in front and you're gonna get two times the sine of theta to the power of one. But then what you have to then do is differentiate sine theta. And when you differentiate sine theta, it gives cos theta. So if you differentiate sine square theta, you're gonna get two times sine of theta to the power of one, times, and when you differentiate sine theta, you get cos theta. So again, when you differentiate sine two theta, this gives cos two theta by two. So that gives two cos two theta. If you differentiate sine squared theta, that's the same as sine of theta all to be squared. The two goes down in front, and then you get sine theta to the power of one. And then when you differentiate sine theta, you then get cos theta. Now, once again, we're going to use that same trigonometric identity again. Two sine theta cos theta, that's the same as sine two theta. So this is the same as sine two theta. Okay, now, um, when we differentiate it, we're going to put it equal to zero. So this constant out in front, we can bring that over and divide. So zero divided by this constant means it disappears. So you just really have two cos two theta minus two sine theta cos theta equal to zero. Okay, but as we said, this two sine theta cos theta, this just becomes sine two theta. Okay. Next of all, if we bring this sine two theta over to the right, so we've got two cos two theta is going to equal sine two theta. And then we're going to use that trick again. We're going to divide both sides by the cos of two theta. Okay. So when you bring this over, it becomes a plus sine two theta. And then we're going to divide both sides by cos of two theta. And this divides in it's just, and just leaves it with two. So cos two theta over cos two theta is just one. So this just leaves it with two. Sine two theta over cos two theta then is just tan two theta. So tan two theta equals two. And this means then two theta is going to be inverse tan of two. If you get the inverse tan of two on your calculator, this tells us what two theta is. And then if you divide that answer by two, it then tells us what theta is. So if you get the inverse tan of two, this works out as 63.4349. And if you divide that by two, this works out as 31.7 degrees or 72 degrees. So we've got the angle theta. So this is the uh, value of theta, which gives a maximum range. Okay. Now, if you did substitute that back into this, this would tell you what the maximum range is. 
if you weren't asked for a maximum range, just the value of theta, which gives a maximum range. Okay, so that's definitely the most difficult type of question you can get on projectiles, where you have to get um, a maximum value um, of theta, or the value of theta, which gives the maximum range. Okay, so next of all, we're gonna move on to 2014. Okay, so 2014, question three. A particle is projected from a point on the horizontal ground with a speed of u meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. The particle is at a height of 7.35 meters above the horizontal ground at times t1 and t2 seconds. And then if t2 minus t1 is one and a half seconds, find the value of u. Yeah, once again, very important to draw a diagram showing the angle of projection. And here we're looking for the two times when the particle is at a height of 7.35 meters above the ground. It's only at the maximum height that you'll have a unique time. All other heights, you'll have two times. So again, this is your I and J axis. This is your initial velocity vector. This here represents the trajectory. Okay, and this is a negative quadratic. Okay, this forms a parabola. Okay, this is the maximum height. That occurs at one time only. All other heights occur at two times. So this is T1 and this would be T2. Okay, now if you add T1, and T2 together, divide by two, that'll give you the maximum height. Okay, that'll always happen as well. So that time plus that time divided by two will give you this time here, okay, the time for maximum height. Um, now in this question, we're told though that T2 minus T1 works out as one and a half seconds. Find the value of U. So you can see here the um, initial velocity vector um, it makes an angle of 30 degrees and this speed is u. So our initial velocity vector u, u is gonna be u cos 30i plus u sine 30j. And we're told these two heights, sy is 7.35. So we need to find out what t1 and t2 are, two times. And they give um, a height of 7.35 meters above the ground. Um, we cannot do anything unless we know the initial velocity vector u though. So u is going to be u cos 30i plus u sine 30j. Now u cos 30 is root 3 u over 2i, and u sine 30 then will be just the u over 2 and j. So ux is root 3 u over 2, so the cos of 30 is root three over two, sine of 30 is a half. So we now know what ux and uy are. You, you cannot do anything without knowing this initial velocity vector. Okay, so we were told that the heights, sy is 7.35. Now the equation for sy on horizontal ground, sy equals uyt minus half g times t squared. Um, SY is 7.35. UY is U over 2. We're looking to find T minus a half G, um, and that'll be G over 2 times T squared. Um, if we multiply everything by 2, this gives 14.7 equals UT minus GT squared. And then if you bring everything over to the left, that's going to become a plus gt squared, a minus ut, and a plus 14.7 equals zero. So this just gives a quadratic equation. Um, and we're going to use the quadratic formula. Now, in this case here, we will need to put in 9.8 for g. So this means we get 9.8 t squared minus ut plus 14.7 equals zero. So to solve a quadratic equation, 
we're going to have to use the quadratic formula. Now here, A is 9.8, B is minus U, and C is 14.7. So A is 9.8, B is minus U, and C is 14.7. Okay, so we're going to use the quadratic formula. T equals minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. So A was 9.8, B is minus U, and C is minus 14.7. So this means T is going to be U plus or minus the square root of U squared minus 4 by 9.8 by minus 14.7. And that's all over 2 times 9.8. So this gives u squared, and if you multiply this out using a calculator, this works out as minus 576.24, and this is all over 19.6. Now we're going to get two times here. T1 is a smaller time, and that's when you use the minus case. So T1 is going to be U minus the square root of U squared minus 576.24 over 19.6. And then T2 is the bigger time. This is going to be U plus the square root of U squared minus 576.24 over 19.6. So we found T1 and T2. Now we were told that T2 minus T1 was 1.5. So T2 minus T1 is going to be all of this minus all of this. Okay, now you can see what happens here. This is a plus U, this is a minus U. So the U's will cancel out. This is a plus the square root of U squared minus 576.24. Minus with a minus is going to change that to a plus. So that's going to be another one of them. So we're going to end up with two of these. So the plus u and the minus u, they're, they're going to cross off anyway. But we've got the square root of u squared minus 576.24 minus minus, which means we've got a plus another one of them. So we're going to end up with two of these. So you're going to have two times the square root of u squared minus 576.24 over 19.6 is T2 minus T1. Okay, so we've got two times the square root of U squared minus 576.24 over 19.6. Now we were told that T2 minus T1 was 1.5. So this is 1.5. And that two divides into 19.6 to give 9.8. So we've got 1.5 equals the square root of u squared minus 576.24 over um, 9.8. Two goes into 19.6 to give the 9.8. If you bring this across and multiply, this gives 14.7. Get rid of the square root. We'll square both sides. If you square 14.7, it gives 216.09. If you bring this across and add, u squared then is going to equal 792.33. And if you get the square root of that, that works out as 49 root 33 over 10 or 28.15 meters per second. Okay. So if the question states find u, it would be fine like that. If it says find the value of u, you do need to give the numerical value. Okay, so the question states find the value of u. So you would need to give the answer as 28.15 meters per second.
look at the part B then. So 2014 question three, part B. A particle is projected up an inclined plane with initial speed u. The line of projection makes an angle alpha with the inclined plane and the plane is inclined at an angle beta to the horizontal. Now this is the standard way we would, the standard notation that's used. Alpha is the angle the projectile makes with the inclined plane and beta is the angle the inclined plane makes with the horizontal. The plane of projection is vertical, it contains the line of greatest slope. Again, that just means you're dealing with projectiles um, in two dimensions, okay? So you can ignore that line. The particle is moving horizontally when it strikes the plane. Okay, so it's very important to draw a diagram to see what this means. We then want to show that tan alpha is tan beta over one plus two tan squared beta. And hence or otherwise show that the tan of alpha is less than the tan of beta. Again, 20 out of 25 marks go for part one, five out of 25 went for part two. Okay, so here the I axis represents your inclined plane. J axis is perpendicular to that. This is the angle alpha. That's the angle the initial velocity vector makes with the inclined plane. Beta is the angle that the inclined plane makes with the horizontal. So here, u equals u cos alpha i plus u sine alpha j. Okay. So the initial speed is u, and the angle alpha is the angle the projectile makes with the inclined plane. That's an angle alpha. Now, we're told here that the particle lands horizontally. If the particle lands horizontally, okay, then that means that the tangent vector, this angle beta is going to be the same as the landing angle. Okay. So tan beta equals tan L. So L is your landing angle, and that's the same as the angle beta. Okay, that's when it lands horizontally. Now, the diagram I've drawn there isn't um, very, very clear. Horizontally means that that should come in like this. Okay, so what happens is that you get a Z angle. So that's horizontally, and this sort of comes in horizontally. So if that's horizontal and that's horizontal, the tan of beta equals the tan of L. So the angle L equals the angle beta. So if a particle strikes horizontally, the landing angle L always equals the angle beta. So tan L equals tan beta. Now the landing angle is always minus Vy over Vx. It's the positive J over the positive I. So uh, Vy is always negative. So minus Vy will be a positive. So tan L is going to equal minus Vy over Vx. And this occurs when Sy equals zero. When the particle lands, Sy equals zero. Okay, so to find the time taken for the particle to land, Sy is uyt minus a half g cos of beta times t squared. So zero is going to equal, so ui we had was u sine alpha, t minus a half g cos of beta times t squared. Get rid of the fraction. If we multiply across by two, zero is going to equal two u sine alpha t minus g cos beta times t squared. This is a quadratic equation in terms of t, and we can just factorize out a t. And we've got zero equals t on two u sine alpha minus g g cos beta times t. Again, the trivial solution is t equals zero. We're not interested in that. So the time of flight is going to be 2u sine alpha over g cos beta. Okay, so when you solve this equal to zero, you get 2u sine alpha over g cos beta is t. So that represents the time of flight. Now, to find the landing angle, we're going to be using the tan of L is minus Vy over Vx. Now, Vy must always work out as minus Uy. You can never assume that, you must always prove it. But that's sort of a checking mechanism. If your Vy works out the same as minus Uy, then you know you're on the right track. 
Now, the equation for Vy, so Vy is going to be Uy minus G cos beta times T. So Vy is Uy minus G cos beta times T. Now, Uy is U sine alpha. Vy must work out as a minus U sine alpha. Okay? You can never assume that. You must always prove it. Okay? But you'll know when that happens. You'll know that you're on the right track. So this means Vy is going to be Uy is U sine alpha minus G cos of beta times the time, which is 2U sine alpha over G cos beta. And you can see what happens here. The G cos beta is cancelled. So we've got U sine alpha minus 2U sine alpha, and that is just minus U sine alpha. So this is actually the proof on why Vy is always minus Uy. So Vy does equal minus U sine alpha. Next of all, we have to work out what Vx is. Now, the equation for Vy, it's Uy minus G cos beta times T. Vx is going to be Ux minus G sine beta times T. So Vx is Ux minus G sine beta times T. Now Ux is U cos alpha. That's going to be minus G sine of beta times T, and T is 2U sine alpha over G cos beta. So this gives, now the Gs will cancel, so you just get 2U sine alpha sine beta over the cos of beta. And cos beta over sine beta is then tan beta. Okay. So you're just left with 2u sine alpha and sine beta over cos beta gives tan beta. So Vx works out as u cos alpha i minus 2u sine alpha tan beta. Okay, now the landing angle to tan of L equals minus Vy over Vx. However, in this question here, we're told that the particle lands horizontally. If the particle lands horizontally, it means that the landing angle is the same as the angle beta. It's the same as the angle that the inclined plane makes with the horizontal. So instead of tan L equals minus Vy over Vx, if it lands horizontally, the tan of beta equals minus Vy over Vx. So the tan of beta then is going to be, so minus Vy, that's going to change that to U sine alpha all over, and the Vx is U cos alpha minus 2U sine alpha tan beta. Okay, now in our final answer, we want everything in terms of tans. Okay, so we don't want sines or coses. And um, if I divide this by cos alpha, it'll change that to a tan. If I divide this by cos alpha, we'll get rid of the coses, it'll just be a u. And if I divide this by cos alpha, it'll change that to a tan alpha. So I'm gonna divide top and bottom here by the cos of alpha. It's just because the final answer has no uh, signs or coses in it. So if I divide everything on top and everything on the bottom by a cos alpha, this is what's gonna happen. Okay, and I can actually divide by u as well. Okay, so that u, that u, and that u. They'd all cross out if you like at this stage. So here, the u's are going to go sine alpha over cos alpha. This is just going to become a tan alpha. And u cos alpha over u cos alpha. This will just become a one minus the u's cancel. And we're going to have two sine over cos is tan alpha, tan beta. So this means tan beta is just going to equal, this simplifies to tan alpha all over one minus two tan alpha tan beta. So tan beta is going to equal tan alpha all over one minus two tan alpha tan beta. Now, we're trying to find out what tan alpha is on its own. 
and um, everything that's on the bottom here, if we bring this across and multiply. So tan beta by one is tan beta minus two tan alpha tan squared beta. Okay, and then on the right hand side, we're just left with the tan of alpha. And tan beta on its own then, if we bring this over, it's gonna add. So tan beta is gonna equal tan alpha plus two tan alpha tan squared beta. And if we factorize out the tan of alpha, we're left with then just one plus two tan squared beta. So to get tan of alpha on its own, tan of alpha is multiplied by the one plus two tan squared beta. If you just bring it over, it's gonna divide. So we're after proving that the tan of alpha does equal tan beta all over one plus two tan squared beta. 20 out of 25 marks were given for that. Now, to be honest with you, most students did actually get that out. It was the next part that they found quite tricky. And this is actually something to do with project maths, not really to do with applied maths. So the next part, we have to show that the tan of alpha is less than the tan of beta. Now, if you've got tan squared beta, that means you're getting the tan of beta to be squared. If you square anything, it becomes a positive number. If you multiply that by two, it's still a positive number. If you add one to it, it's a positive number bigger than one. Okay. So here on the right-hand side, we've got the tan of beta and underneath that, we've got some number bigger than one. Now, this equation then tells us that tan alpha equals the tan of beta divided by some number bigger than one. So we need to divide tan beta by some number bigger than one to make it equal to tan alpha. So that means the tan beta must definitely be bigger than tan alpha. So tan beta divided by something bigger than one then equals tan alpha. So it's because of that, it means the tan beta must be bigger than tan alpha or tan alpha has to be less than tan beta. So it's because of this that one plus two tan squared beta must be bigger than one. And this is mathematical notation. This upside down A stands for, for all beta an element of zero comma pi over two. Okay. So you were given that in the question. Okay, well, sorry. You, it's, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't matter what beta is anyway. Now, beta can't be pi over two because um, the tan of 90 doesn't exist. Okay, so it has to be something sort of between zero and pi over two, but not equal to pi over two. Okay, so this is something really to do with project maths. It's inequalities. It's not something usually that you would get with applied maths. Okay, um, but students that wrote down anything like that got full marks. Students sort of either got zero or full marks. If they left the blank, they got zero. If they, if they made some statement with it, they sort of got full marks, okay? So again, it's because two tan squared beta is positive. When you add one to that, you get a positive number bigger than one, such as the number two, such as the number three. These are all positive numbers bigger than one. So you have to divide tan of beta by some number bigger than one to make it equal to tan alpha. So because of that, tan beta has to be bigger than tan alpha. And that's all that. And um, we just had to prove it that question.